J'espère que ça a été 10 heures, mes amis. Écoutez-moi ça. What you just heard is 12 year old little me obsessed about getting a Commodore 64 so badly that I went to my friend's house who had one and brought a tape recorder and recorded some songs so I could bring them back home and listen to them. I eventually got my own and then some, but I'm convinced that my career path would be very different if it wasn't for the Commodore 64 SID chip and how it blew my mind back then. I know we've released a product that had this sound chip in it before, but trust me, after 15 years of new research, we completely blow this one out of the water. So in this video, I'll try to recap some of the research, gear and techniques that we have used in order to create Chipsense C64, which we are releasing today. And I sincerely hope you enjoy this very personal nerdy trip of mine. First, if you don't know what the SID is, here's the incredibly simple TLDR. The SID chip was manufactured for 10 years between 82 and 92 and is half analog and half digital. It has three independent oscillators, each with their own ADSR and waveform selection, and only one single filter for all three. The reason being the 6581 was meant to be sold as one voice inside a polyphonic synthesizer. That was just a prototype and was never commercialized. While the later revision 5 of the chip is more consistent between chip to chip and closer to the original specification, the earlier 6581s varied greatly from chip to chip. In fact, there is no definitive 6581 sound, only the one that was used by the composer or its listener. This makes it incredibly difficult to get an accurate picture unless we study a whole bunch of them. The first time I heard about fake chips was in this blog post by Keftris in 2009. And if you haven't seen it yet, that's my most popular video ever. So Keftris got a whole bunch of SID chips that were remarked, and I got a few of them as well. And uh, more and more I heard people uh, having issues with their SID, so I designed in 2010 something called SIDbench. That's a simple basic program that anyone with a Commodore 64 could type in with very little effort and it would basically tell you if all the waveforms were working and if the filter made any sound in all the three modes. Sidbench was used in a few places and one that I'm most uh, proud of is for the Stone Oak Valley Authentic Sid collection where they took it as a way to fingerprint what the Sid that they used was like. In case you didn't know, a few registers on the SID are actually readable. On top of the paddle controls, which are analog potentiometers, you can also read the instantaneous state of the waveform in oscillator 3, and also the envelope of oscillator 3. Like this YouTube test, whereas each character changes when the level of the envelope changes. I also tried various ways to grab its combined waveforms, but that implied dumping them to RAM and saving them to disk and back to my computer. Surely we can do better, right? So we disconnect the SID from its typical 1 MHz clock and drive it instead externally using a GPIO pin from an FTDI device on a separate test board. We in fact take full control of its other pins as well, chip select, read write, address, data pins, you name it. So what we essentially do is fake the normal 6502 style bus operation, toggling all those signals in the order the chips expects all the while counting the exact clocks that we feed it, writing specific test values to the third voice envelope and oscillator, then constantly read either OSC3 or M3 for as long as they change. We dump all the values we read sequentially to a binary file and we then proceed to compare this with what our emulator outputs. We have done over 50 different edge case tests and ran those on both 6581 and 8580. Surprisingly, our clock writes were still fast enough for the NMOS and HMOS2 logic to function deterministically. We also use the same rig and the new Salier Pro logic analyzer directly on the external capacitor pins and monitor just how exactly voltage changed. This was really labor intensive and it took an eternity just to get the initial set of 18 different chip models in the alpha release. Sadly, we forgot to capture a few other things that made each chip special and had to completely rethink our process. The new test suite has to cover a lot more stuff, be less error prone and be much faster, especially since I uh, kind of bought quite a few more chips and some people loaned me some, including the ARLS R4, a loaner from my friend Lord Nightmare, and also something I didn't expect, which is a holy grail, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. We thus created another native program for the 64, but this time it had to be cycle accurate. 
By stopping the VIG-2 and CIAs and only counting CPU cycles, we were assured that we could capture the signal deterministically and clock accurately, which was not the case for Sidbench as it was a basic program. And by using the Salier Pro Logic Analyzer set to capture a digital signal on the SID's input clock and a separate analog signal on the SID output, and after gigabytes of data, we resampled and averaged the analog data which matched the NTSC machines we have. Signal V2A goes through all the chip's combined waveforms, which we missed in the old setup, thinking they were all the same across types, its waveform DAC, envelope levels, how it responds to various forms of sample playback, again, totally different across chips, its relative filter mixing level, including filter bleeding, and its resonance levels while signal V2B captures the nonlinear behavior of the filter, which is again unique to each chip. It combines all three channels into a progressively louder square wave. We run this on a vast array of filter cutoff, resonance and filter type settings. This eventually gets us the filter response to input changes of any size, and we can then accurately reconstruct how it will distort. Our offline analysis program then automatically creates a new model entry for the emulator to use. So this was so far pretty theoretical and science-y, but how does it sound in practice? Can we devise A-B listening tests? And against what? And isn't this just a synth? Right? It cannot play vintage tracks? Or can it? Well, we had no choice but to call our own SID player. And there went two years of my life. You cannot just do a SID player, that doesn't exist by itself. If you follow the pieces specifications to the letter, you will play maybe half the songs right or at all. See, many pieced files, which are supposed to represent the sound routines to be called at each frame, actually want to control a whole 64. Uh, those were initially normally tagged as RSID for real SID, but since many rips were made to run on SIDplay or Vice's VSID, and since those provide a complete C64 environment, then everything else hoping to play more than half of the high voltage SID collection need to emulate the full environment as well. You'd be surprised at the amount of new discoveries that were made and techniques that were developed post 2000. Like the one in Vicious SID from the Human Coding Machine or Music Run Stop need not only a cycle-accurate SID, but also a cycle-accurate CPU and CIA cores. And all those things need to run in perfect lockstep, talking to each other through various messages, IRQs, etc. So I had to implement a cycle-accurate 6510 emulation and CIA, the later which needed reverse engineering to play back complex songs for me. And let's not talk about some edge cases and problematic sick tunes which rely on read-modify writes and all that kind of crap. So now that we have a full C64 emulator and SID player, it was time to decide on which songs we would actually use as basis for our QA. Some tracks that highlighted the filter curves and distortion differences. Two famous numbers by Chris Hulls Beck. <laughs> How could we miss Skate or Die by Rob Harbert? And of course, uh, Mahoney's Music Run Stop, which used the full filter register as a pseudo 8-bit DAC. Every bit of the filter and volume control have to be, and DC volumes of everything, have to be perfect for it to sound good. And a later entry, which abuses the noise reset using a periodic rate modulation. So it basically turns the SID into a Tia or Pokey. These three jammer tracks generate the most difference across uh, some revisions. They really abuse everything, they're amazing. So 
I recorded the intro to all those songs on 32 different chips and had to QA them all. <laughs> Do the math. This includes not only a very early SID found in a Max machine, but also its prototype, a ceramic R1. Andy Finkel, on behalf of the company, thank you a million times again for that loan. We have ground. We have plus five. I will try to sort out my notes and recording and publish them soon, I promise. We have plus 12. Perfect. As final icing on the cake, and as seen in my previous videos, we've also made a version of MD Fourier for the C64, which was especially helpful not only to verify the waveforms and digi-level balances, but also to evaluate the filtering of the RF modulator in the C64, which you can opt in if you want. So, thank you for the five of you still with me. I need to stop the video short for today, there's plenty more to say, but I have already planned something on the main channel, or here, about the grabbing function, and also I'm going to be doing some live tests, um, outputting to a real SID chip live uh, while I mess with stuff. So, thank you again for listening, you know what to do, subscribe, leave a comment, thank you.